hello there, welcome back to the channel, Nerd World Empire, and back to the Terran Empire. And a little bit more of politics, because I know how popular those videos are, but not exactly, no. More a discussion on a particular group within the Terran Empire, and that would be the Lords of the Terran Empire. So, before we get started, please like, share, subscribe, comment down below, and... Let's just get started on the Lords of the Terran Empire. The Lords of the Terran Empire were the close council of the various different emperors that presided over the Empire. Of course, like any regime, it needs some form of government. It doesn't matter whether that government is democratic, autocratic, or anything in between, it's really irrelevant. Some form of leadership is always needed. Even in an anarchy, someone's got to be in charge. Now, of course, the Emperor was ultimately in charge, but I didn't see the Emperor, Giorgio, or anyone else making day-to-day -day decisions on behalf of the general citizenry. That fell down to various different levels within the government. Of those levels, though, there was one level that was considerably higher than the others, and that was her personal council, the Lords of the Terran Empire. Now, to put this in perspective, this was a bit like a, a more like a medieval sort of co royal court. These were hand-picked men and women given titles and power and wealth, probably some military prestige as a lot of them wore uniforms, meaning although they may not have specifically come up within Starfleet or within any other military organization within the Empire, they certainly had authority over them, albeit a political authority. These were her personal advisors and the executors of her will. They did this to get wealthy and powerful, maybe to one day even become emperor themselves, or be given a juicy, wealthy, plum title and power base for which maybe to live out the rest of their lives in safety and comfort, perhaps away from the intrigue that was the Terran Imperial Court. But to get there, you gotta go through these stages. These men and women were amongst the most ruthless and most violent and brutal in the Terran Empire. You don't get to the top without smashing a few eggs beneath your jackboots in the Terran Empire. Now, it's entirely plausible many of these men and women didn't backstab and connive and murder their way to the top. Of course, as I've mentioned in previous videos, no regime, absolutely none, can sustain a system like that indefinitely, or even for anything more than a short period of time. Upheaval and general infighting, fine, but a sheer, the sheer amount of violence and brutality inflicted upon one another by the Terrans as we see sometimes depicted, would be unreasonable to assume that it is across the spectrum. However, when you get close to the top, I'm betting that that stuff is pretty routine. And everyone will be out to screw everyone else over and elevate themselves, having their own little loyal clique, their own allies, and their own people, enemies, and friends that they keep close. The title itself, as well, Lord, is bestowed upon them when they reach this title by the Emperor. It's either Lord or Lady, of course, depending on their respective gender. They're all Terran, there are no non-Terrans in this group, and they basically wield almost unlimited power, almost equal to that of the Emperor themselves. Basically, when they speak, you kind of assume they're speaking for the Emperor. This, of course, made them targets of people who would like to be there themselves, but simply this as shown sometimes in the Empire. Oh, you kill your superior, you take their place. That's not the case. You don't kill one of these people and get to take their place. They're personally appointed by the Emperor. However, that doesn't make you safe, as we do see with Emperor Giorgio when Michael Burnham, from her point, quite innocently establishes that she is actually a representative of the United Federation of Planets, not the Terran Empire, coming from an alternate timeline, a piece of information that the Terrans basically classified over a hundred years earlier, wanting no one to know about the existence of such an entity like the United Federation of Planets, as it was considered politically subversive, she instantly killed every one present, meaning everyone bar one member of her inner council was killed at this exact moment. 
Meaning again, not exactly safe to be at the top. The Emperor can kill you on a whim and there'll be no consequences for it. Now that brings me to the one point that originally led me into this video. Lord Ealing. Lord Ealing was the Terran who was spurred execution by the Emperor. Now of course this probably wasn't the entire Lords of the Terran Empire. There were probably more, some of them back on Earth, others probably exerting her will and influence at various different points within the Terran Empire or on Vulcan or Andoria or other such places. Although it should be pointed out that in exchange for not telling anyone that she had killed the other members of the Lords, he was going to be made governor of Andor, probably a position that apparently was quite desirable as Andoria was an important world within the Terran Empire, rich resources of troops people and technology for the empires. The Andorians were a very advanced people and integral to the empire in a lot of different ways. So becoming the governor there meant it was a politically important appointment because you would be presiding over a people the empire very much wanted to keep on their side and within the empire, as well as use them for whatever ends the Terrans like to use some of the more liberal species within the empire for. Anyway, get into another point. Lord Ealing was interesting. Why him? This was the first thought that brought me into this video. I was sort of pondering it. She killed everyone else. Why him? Was it random chance he was the last one in line and she, she just picked him at random? Was he a lover? Was he a relative? We don't know. He was killed not long after by Lorca's followers when they captured the ISS Sharon, so we may never know, as she never actually said. But clearly she trusted him enough to know that he wasn't going to tell anyone. He wasn't going to dob her into the authorities, which probably would have been political and literal suicide on his part anyway, because they would have just likely killed him for being a, a snitch. If not killed him, he definitely would have lost his position of power and authority, and probably would have found himself being some administrator of a mine on one of Mars's moons or something. So yeah, he wasn't going to tell anyone. But again, why was she so confident of this fact? That's what kind of brought me into this line of thought. Understanding who the Lords are is part of this. She handpicks all these people. But there was something about this one that made him stand out. Now it could, as I said, have simply been, oh, there's, I don't know how many there were, 10 people here. Kill them. He's the last one in the line. He gets to live. He covers up the deaths, makes them look like an accident or an attack or whatever and makes up some lie to ship security and to the royal guard and to the rest of the court as to what happened to them. Maybe he says, oh, they attempt, they, they collaborated together to attempt to assassinate the emperor and they had to be executed as a result for treason. It's plausible. That's probably what he would have gone with, but we don't really know. Whatever cover-up he was going to use was lost when the Sharon was destroyed anyway, so knowledge of the Emperor killing her in a council may have been lost with that destruction, regardless. But it was an interesting thought going through my head, and I was curious, you know, what other people think? Why him? Again, relative, lover, friend, all of the above, maybe, you know, Terrans. Why let him live? And where do you think that the lords of the Terran Empire actually fit into the political and military landscape. Because bear in mind, the model is more on the Roman Empire, but like like the medieval kings, the Romans had sort of their hand-picked sort of cronies who would always be around them. So, yeah. Only a short video, just curious to sort of throw this thought process out there. Let me know in the comments below your thoughts on this and why in particular, which was again my main thought process coming into this video, why Lord Ealing, why was he spared when all the other lords, at least all the other lords who were present, were simply killed and counted as disposable by the Emperor. I just want to take this moment to thank you for watching that video. If you liked what you saw, please check out my social links in the description box below to Instagram and Twitter and others. And also is down there a link to my Patreon page where you can support this channel and the others as I try to grow this franchise and do this more regularly. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, thank you for watching and bye bye.